Okay, so I'm just kind of digging into my browser here. Uh, so that's okay, this doesn't get bigger. So let's see, I sort of clicked on this little thing where it says connection is secure. Uh, and then I clicked on the certificate thing. And so there's a few different fields in here. Um, so I found here it says subject public key info, public key algorithm. And so here it says elliptic curve public key algorithm. So that's using elliptic curves, which inherit the discrete logarithm security in order to derive a public, public key. And so here's the public key here. So I could copy and paste that uh, into, into the slide. So there's some other information here. We see ECC, that's short for elliptic curve cryptography. Um, and now I said about Canvas. So let's go to Canvas. That's good, I should bookmark the class. Okay, and let's see what Canvas says. So, public key algorithm here on Canvas. Again, I know it's tiny for you, but it says RSA encryption. And then we look at the public key. Uh, for example, if I just paste it in, you can see how big the public key is. Um, so it's a lot bigger in terms of the number of bits that's required than the elliptic curve one. So just a quick difference there that you can just pull out of your browser between Canvas, well that was GitHub on the slides here, I've got uh, Wikipedia using ECC. Now it's not necessarily super important for your website because your website is only setting up a session once, you know, maybe when you, uh, and then it's storing the information. So you're not continually doing this. But for a blockchain, if you're continually verifying signatures as new information is coming in, then it starts to add up. All right, so elliptic curves are kind of like a branch of cryptography and algebra. So I printed this, again, it's just a subset, just a couple pages to give you an idea of what some of these standards look like. So when you look up an elliptic curve, you're gonna see some like domain parameters and they're gonna be like really big constants. If I look at page three right in the middle, it says it's defined y squared defined as x cubed plus ax plus b. And so I've just typed that here into my graphing calculator as is. Uh, and then at the end it says mod p, right? So where p is a big prime number, mod, mod is the modulo. So that's what an elliptic curve looks like. And then the rest has to do with specifics so that you define a particular curve. On the next page, there is the one that Bitcoin uses, so it's particularly famous these days, SECP 256K1, and it gives you just some of the info, so the, uh, the size is 256, uh, the K means it's a Koblitz variety, and that means that it comes with some parameters, which are on page nine. So if you're going to open SSL or Wikipedia or you're programming the stuff yourself, you're gonna need these parameters. Uh, and so we can see some of them here, P, A, B, G, N, and H for just for this specific curve. For example, P, the big prime number, I find this stuff kind of interesting. So the prime number is two to the 256, which obviously by itself uh, is the power of two, so that's not a prime number. Uh, and then we're kind of like subtracting various powers of two. Minus two to 32, minus two to nine, all the way down to minus one. And that is gonna be the prime that we start with. Um, and then FP, the stylized F here, that means field of primes. 
uh, not primes, field of size by the P field of size P. Anyways, um, so if I look at my elliptic curve, I can kind of change the shape here by changing this constant, and I get like some interesting properties of my elliptic curve. depending on what the values of A and B are. And if I zoom out, we can see how this thing looks. So they're just a unique class of functions. So on the left, we are looking at the real numbers, and that means you include all the decimal numbers and everything in between the integers. And then on the right, we're looking at an FP, a field of size 17. You can kind of make out the 17 grid system here. And we no longer have lines connecting these, but we can see the shape and see how it relates. And then three down here, see how it relates to our, if we do something like this, that maybe is, oops, something like this, that maybe is how it relates, but um, as a field, we're only interested in these integer values, these points, and we're not interested in the numbers in between the points. And so our large prime number, you know, it's gonna be a massively, impossibly massive grid that these points are going to be on. Okay, so I tried to work out some of this in, uh, in, in Desmos. So I've got like my curve here in blue and I've got some constants. So I'll try to give an overview of how elliptic curves are related to the discrete logs. So we start with this point here as a generator point that's on the curve, and this is public, so we publish it. From here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna generate or we're gonna calculate some value further on down the track. So the, the procedure to do that involves taking a tangent line and then finding an intersecting value. So we can see the intersection up here as Q. And then once we have the intersection, we're going to reflect it. So we come down here. This is called point addition. Just as a, as a method to arrive at this point down here on the curve. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the tangent down here and we're gonna come back up here to where the tangent intersects the curve again. So it looks like it's about here. And then we're gonna reflect that point. So we're gonna come down here. And we get another point, so that would be another addition. And then we take another tangent from here and of course I didn't draw these out. Um, I didn't map these out in the calculator. So we were about here, we take another tangent, finds out where it, where it intersects, reflect, take another tangent, and we're doing this looping procedure that we started with a known point. So back to the blue dots. The procedure says we start with a known point and then we're kind of jumping around to different points through a recipe. It's deterministic, so you can start at the beginning and you can go through and you can arrive at the output again. But this is such a huge grid that if we just start with the point, it would take someone you know, a very long time in order to loop through and find all the possibilities. So using key generation um, to input, input some randomness, figure out how many times you're gonna loop through this elliptic curve, find a point that's on the curve, now the benefit here is that it's easy to verify a point is on a curve. So you have an equation, so you can verify, right? I have my equation up here. I can put in my x value. But it's difficult to start with a y value and then figure out, oh, is that on the curve or is it not on the curve? So the discrete log says you have this limited field of possibilities that it's going to be in, okay? And the same thing applies here. You have this limited field. Uh, where the points could be. So we know a point is there, but we don't know exactly which one it is. 
So that's uh, that's a five minute intro to uh, to elliptic curves, and I'm not a cryptographer, so uh, I don't know a tremendous amount about this stuff uh, myself. But the mathematics underpinning it is the discrete log, and that's how we can be assured that uh, it's difficult, if not impossible, to guess somebody's key and steal their you know steal their funds, steal their identity, start to impersonate them. All right, so I mentioned this before, but again, asymmetric cryptography based on these two mathematical problems, prime factorization and the discrete log. And you know, in practice, what you get out here is you derive a private key. So you're thinking that this maps to a point on your elliptic curve. And then from here, you derive a public key. And this you can publish, post online. So people can send you Bitcoin here, right? If you're a merchant, publish it on your website. But you can't go back. You can't go from here to here, OK? If you could go from here to here, then you'd be in trouble. So you can only go one way. All right, last one for today uh, has to do with digital signatures. Um, so again, very, very common in computing. What Alice is going to do is she's going to sign a message with her private key such that Bob can then use her public key to verify the message. Uh, and you know, signing a message, it, it could be mundane, like, hello, Bob, how do you do? Or, you know, or it could be important, like a vote or an attestation to some data, like, yes, I was there at this time and I saw this. Yes, that's my vote. I signed the message. Yes, you can spend those Bitcoins. I signed the message. So digital signatures, they, you know, they go hand in hand with asymmetric encryption. OK, so some links that will appear to some of the things we have discussed today are also on the paper that you have in front of you. You know, we tried to, doing cryptography in one day is impossible. Um, but you can't do blockchain stuff and Bitcoin without cryptography. And so we have to crack open that book a little bit and have a look at why. You know, you know it's very important that people trust why it's safe to send your credit card information online, right? It's very important that people trust why it's safe to sign a transaction on a blockchain um, and, and why there's mathematics involved and not just the authority of some centralized individual.